Welcome back to another episode of Being at Work. I am your host, Andrea Butcher, and we've got a good conversation for you today. You know, each of these episodes highlights a leadership lesson. And when I asked today's guest about a pivotal moment, he said more like a pivotal experience. The leadership lessons he learned from the cockpit while flying for the Navy are pivotal to how he leads his business and serves his clients. Dave Hartman is the president of Hartman Executive Advisors, an independent technology advisory firm. But what you really need to know about Dave are the five key lessons he learned as an aircraft mission commander. Lessons that are so relevant to all business leaders today. And I love how he breaks them down and shares stories across each of these really important leadership lessons. So listen in as we explore the importance of staying connected to the bigger picture and how to navigate that with everything going on. Listen in as we talk about the challenge in trusting your instruments and the key data that you have available to you, and also the power in the backup plan, amongst lots of other things. Check it out. I'm very proud of my career, especially the last 18 years of growing and leading Hartman Executive Advisors. But in a lot of ways, my journey has been accidental along the way. And even, you know, you talked about uh, the lessons from the cockpit. That wasn't even part of a plan. Like I didn't grow up always wanting to be a naval aviator. I just kind of lucked into it with a great conversation many, many years ago. But I do think that everything I've done throughout my career has built upon itself and has brought me to where I am now and the company I'm leading. So in some ways it's been accidental, but in some ways it's been very purposeful at taking advantage of opportunity. Yeah, that's interesting. It wasn't necessarily planned, but now you see all of the connection points. So I was, uh, it, it was about maybe seven years ago and I was having a conversation with someone very much like yourself, an executive advisor in the industry and we started talking about our backgrounds and and i talked about my background as an aviator and i said you know one of these days i want to write a book (laughs) and he said well you should start with a chapter and then ironically about a month later a friend of mine came to me and said i want you to write a chapter what do you think and i'm like i know exactly what i'm gonna say and so i wrote this chapter that actually turned out to be pretty cool and it and i use it every once in a while in, in conversations like this because there really is i mean Aviation is a very different world, especially military aviation, but it starts with that leadership and it starts with the person either guiding that aircraft or guiding that mission, or in the case that we're talking about guiding business. And there are a lot of similarities, a lot of overlap. Yeah. I was really struck because you sent me the chapter. And so I got to read through those five leadership lessons from the cockpit and they're so relevant. I mean, I've never been in that environment, but thinking about leading a leadership development business as I do today, all of those things, so helpful. So these are timeless leadership lessons that are relevant to all leaders. Yeah, I hope so. The first one is constantly scan your environment. And you think, well, what does that really have, you know, mean? In a cockpit, it absolutely is critical because you can get so locked in on a certain thing, whether it's a certain instrument or the horizon, and you have to constantly scan your environment. And in business, it's so easy for us to get locked in on one metric or on one plan and lose sight of the big picture. You have to constantly remind yourself, I've got to step up and figure out what else is going on around me. Because if you're not constantly scanning, you can get in trouble. If you're not understanding your environment, keeping your head out of the dashboard, so to speak, and keep it up and keep that good scan of your horizon, scan of what's coming, what are your people saying? What are your customers saying? that you have to pay attention to that maybe you were thinking about yesterday. Yeah, and what I so appreciate about the message there is it's zooming in and zooming out. So it's both. How do you do that day to day? What does that look like for you as a leader today? I think in reality, I think for me, it's not allowing myself, you know, it's that old saying, focus on your business, not in your business. Mm -hmm. And it's not allowing yourself to get too deep into any one area. And so I do find that it's purposeful. I have to remind myself not to get focused in on whether it's 
any one operational issue or any one project, but to stay above that, I've got great people. And that's kind of the second one, actually, you're only as good as your team, obviously. And that's, that goes without saying, I mean, people are ubiquitous to everything we do. And I don't have to tell you that, but I think it is, you know, trusting your people. And as a CEO, as a president of a company, keeping above that, so you can connect the dots on what you're seeing and connect what's going on over here with what's going on over there, what happened yesterday with what might be happening tomorrow. And if you're having to be too much of an operator or too much of a salesperson or too much of a financial leader as an executive, as a CEO, you're, I think you're going to lose the opportunity to connect the dots on all those things. It's such a good point. You call leadership lesson one constantly scanning your environment, but you're doing that so that you can make decisions and be intentional. That's just as important, isn't it? Based on what I see, here's what I'm going to choose to do. Absolutely. Because, you know, like in a cockpit, your visual environment may tell you a very different story than your instruments. You might be looking outside the aircraft and see one thing but your instruments tell you a very different story. And if you get locked in on any one of those metrics, you can get in trouble. And of course that, that applies to business as well. And you know, you have to be careful, you trust your data, but you have to be looking around at different input to make sure that you're not seeing a false read on something. Yeah. And looking at what's the story as I'm looking across all of those things, as I'm scanning the environment in my instruments and the metrics and all of it. It could feel like a lot, right? How do you manage all of it? Like, really, I've got to look at all of those things? <laughs> you know, it's funny because I was a mission commander. I was not a pilot. The pilot has a different job to do as a mission commander. I had the entire mission. And so I had to be worried about what was going on up front, but I also had to be worried about what was going on in the back of the aircraft as well. And so I think that role as an aviator kind of set me up well for the company I lead now. But, um, you know, I mentioned checklists later on mm -hmm. in the chapter, and I don't really mean for business that you really should work from a checklist. But, you know, if you talk about a dashboard, for instance, there are four or five key operating indices that everybody knows that those are the most important thing that you have to look at for your business. And I think keeping an eye on those four or five things, not 20 and not one, but, you know, knowing what are those four or five key metrics that I have to understand while I'm also walking around and talking to customers and looking outside at the economy and what's happening. And I think that's your scan, both inside and outside the cockpit, so to speak. So focus is important there. Are you scanning the right things? But then also like stay in big picture. Because the other thing I hear in that, Dave, is it's not reacting to any one thing. It's looking across so that like multiple data points and what's the story that's being told like that's informing you right that's what you mean by the bigger picture absolutely now i think sometimes you do have to know how to react right and i think sometimes you have to make that quick decision and you don't have time to drag that decision out for weeks i think the pandemic was a good example i remember the first several weeks of things we had to do and every leader had to do to to help their company react. I remember on a Friday thinking we were ahead of the game. And by the Monday after I <laughs> thought, we, man, we are so late. It's not even funny. Yeah. And so sometimes you do have to, you know, to react quickly. Hopefully if you've done your homework before that, you understand the environment well enough to react quickly. It's kind of like, I was ready to, I was ready to compare it to driving a car. And it is like, sometimes when you're driving a car, you have to swerve quickly. You don't have time to look around and decide, do I go right? Do I go left? You have to turn. But if you've scanned your environment in the last few seconds and you know what's around you, you pretty instinctively know I can swerve right here safely. But if you haven't done that scan recently, then all of a sudden you're gonna be in a situation where I don't know what way to turn. I don't know which way is best. I love that. It's a more purposeful reaction then. I also suspect that having the big picture in mind frees me up from the more tactical. And this goes then to your second leadership lesson, the team, because then you have people who you're leveraging and relying on to carry out the things that need to be done based on the bigger picture. No doubt. And look, team has always been critical. I think in you know, the last several years, team has become even more critical. Relying on your team, having a great team, engaging your team 
is, is become more critical uh, than ever. I think back to a quote by, and I don't mean to name drop here, but one of my longtime colleagues and also a client of ours, um, but is one of our first clients, Steve Case, who used to be the chairman of AOL. And of course, now he has his own thriving small business that he's re regrowing. But uh, he said in his latest book, basically, every company has great people in their company, but every company has more great people not in their company. In other words, mm -hmm. if you're only relying on the people inside your four walls, you're probably missing out on perspectives and insights from people not in your company. And I think then the balance is, how do you balance those two? You have to trust your people, but then you also have to give them permission to look outside you know, their own four walls to get advice from the outside. You call this leadership lesson like only being as good as the team supporting you. That's right. And I mean, to that quote, if your team is only your W-2 employees, well, that could be great. But if your team is also, you know, your team of advisors, if you're thinking about your clients and your constituents as part of your team, if you're thinking outside of that. I think that even broadens who it is that's supporting you. How did that play out for you in the cockpit? How did you learn that lesson? That's kind of funny because again, accidental, right? When I got into aviation, like everybody, I guess we wanted to be, you know, Top Gun. The first Top Gun was coming out. Everybody wanted to be a fighter pilot and <laughs> that wasn't in the cards for me. My eyes, um, you know, you can't, the audience can't see me, but I'm certainly wearing glasses right now, but my eyes weren't cut out to be a jet pilot. So I got to choose a different aircraft and that aircraft was the P3, which was an aircraft that with a crew of 13 instead of, you know, maybe a crew of one or maybe two in the case of an F-14. And I think somehow God had a plan for me because that was the perfect environment for me to have a crew of not just, it wasn't about me. It was about a crew of great people that had all had their roles. And of course, for us to be successful, everyone had to play their own role. And then we had to kind of pull it all together and almost like a symphony, you know, work together to achieve our mission. And we were very successful. I had a great crew. I had some of the best people in the Navy, I felt like, working with me. But I think the fact that it was part of a larger crew and not just about what I was doing in the cockpit or in my role, I think was it was incredibly impactful for what I'm doing now and sort of what it led to in business. But I can't say that was part of a plan either. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that none of you could have accomplished what you did without each other. None of us is as smart as all of us. We need each other. The natural gifts and strengths that everybody brings contributes. Yeah, I love that. Everyone playing their role. And so creating an environment where people can do that well. So you brought up Top Gun. I have to know, what's your experience watching those movies? Like, is it realistic? Are you into it? Is it annoying? Because you're like, oh, they totally missed that. I can't. I mean, I, I, I'm, that's probably out, outside of my knowledge zone because I'm not an... A, a, an aircraft, a fighter pilot or a fighter uh, aviator. But I've heard from friends of mine that the second one is a lot more realistic. I think they're both realistic in that they're both people stories, right? And I think at the end of the day, everything we do comes back to people. And we may all have a technical role to play in our, in our world and our lives, but it all comes down to trusting people, trusting yes. your colleagues, trusting that person behind you or the person in front of you. And so I think from that perspective, I think both Top Guns are were more people stories than they were you know, fighter stories. So you like the movies? Oh, I love them both. I mean, of course, the first one, like I said, you know, we, I was in flight school during the first one and I, you know, we all thought we were tough stuff. I remember <laughs> about 20 of us went to the movie in our flight suits in Pensacola, Florida. So we, we digress, but I really appreciate your point that it is, they are relationship focused and that's what this leadership lesson is all about. You're only as good as the team supporting you. And then I love number three. I, I love how you name it. Trust your instruments. Well, I think we all sort of lead by our gut or decide by our gut. And we all have instinct, right? We all have, you know, we have this instinct or we have this gut feel about something. And that's, hmm. and gut is important, right? You have to sometimes go with your gut. But at the same time, you can't only make decisions that way. And so in the cockpit, I think I told that, I think that was a part of the chapter where I talked about that false horizon where, you know, if you get too focused on, on, on something you're seeing, you think you're seeing, you can get in trouble in, in an aircraft. 
But I think it's true in business also. You should trust your gut and you should trust your experience. But I also think mm -hmm. that leaning on key data, leaning on key metrics, KPIs, I think are also important because you can get fooled into a false horizon, so to speak, about your company, about your own profitability, about what your customers are saying. If you don't take the time to really understand and look at data, look at information and then work that into your decision making. So I'm probably a mix in my business life of sort of trusting my gut, but also trusting data and putting those two together and then figuring out what, what direction to go. The value is in both. Because I have the data, I'm able to trust my instincts and vice versa. That's right. Now in the cockpit, I mean, you know, if you're flying through the clouds or if you're in a storm, that's all you have is instruments. And so it is a little bit different there. Well, it also goes back to, you said leaning on key data in scanning your environment to ensure that you're looking at the right things. So how do you go about in your business today or in the cockpit? How do you determine like what's the right data? Because there's so much data that we could collect. I'm a big dashboard fan, information dashboards. And so for me, my dashboard in my company is a combination of what each of my department heads think are important. So the one or two things that they think are important, three or four things that I think on top of that. And then I kind of try to sift that down to a total of six or seven of the most important things. So we have a dashboard that we look at all the time that has seven key data points that are a mix of some more department centric, some more cross department or cross functional in nature, and then some, you know, very, very strategic. And those are the seven things that we constantly look at. And together we have one person that's responsible for tracking that information, but we all look at it and we all try to make sure we understand what that data point means to the company. It connects you as a team. So it goes back to the second one. And it, it's like, those are the things that you're constantly scanning as well. So there's just such a connection between these leadership lessons for sure. So number four, so this is uh, operators around the world. We're so excited to see you say leadership lesson number four, checklists save lives. Could we say SOPs save lives? That's right. I mean, as I said, I think in the chapter, I'm not telling people they should you know, walk around with checklists, but methodology, right? And there are, you know, there's real efficiency in understanding process, right? And understanding methodology. If you, and if you want to say SOPs process, the more you can rely on a procedure, the more you can reduce your costs, right? Whether that means you can hire more junior people to do these things because they are well-defined methodologies that don't need as much thought and pre-thought or, you know, whether it's just a matter of the efficiency of connecting the dots between processes, you know, there's real money in understanding methodology and process. And, and it's not just about in a cockpit, it might be about saving lives. It's not just about life or death, but there's real in business, the more we can be methodology centric, the more we can drive efficiency, drive effectiveness, yeah. drive cost, uh, which, you know, has so many implications. And it just provides clarity, doesn't it, to our team. In the chapter that you wrote, you used the example of Sully, who landed the U.S. Airways flight in the Hudson River in 2009. Of course, in that kind of situation, you know, FAA regulations say you have to pull out the checklist. Certainly, and any pilot would tell you, you know, they don't need to go to that checklist because, you know, they know it so well. They know it like the back of their hand. They don't have to pull that out. But they do because in a, an environment like that, having the checklist in front of you is one less thing you have to think about. But I think using the word checklist for uh, the cockpit, I think in business, it's about methodology or procedure, right? And if right. you have a standard operating procedure, you might understand something about your business well enough that you don't have to go back to that. But when you can go back to that, I think gives you, like you said, comfort in, in, in efficiency and sort of making sure that we're all singing from the same sheet of music, so to speak. You know, if you have a good methodology and a good procedure, you don't have to worry about, well, how is Johnny doing and how is Sally doing it? You know, we're all doing things the same way and that creates comfort as well and efficiency. I, I so appreciate that. It just makes it easier. It removes unnecessary stress from the situation. So silly example, but I have an SOP for traveling. Whenever I go to pack my bag, and at this point, I've memorized it, and I picked this up in a previous business, 
that I was in, the owner of the business was huge on process and systems are the solution. He was a big e-myth guy and everybody read e-myth. We had processes for everything. And as annoying as that was at time, it did exactly what you're describing. It removed the complexity. It removed the stress. Everyone was clear on what we're doing. And he had an SOP for business trips, for traveling. And so I adopted that. And you know what? I've never forgotten the things I need. I wish I'd had your checklist. And as embarrassing <laughs> as it is to say, we were over in Europe one time. And of course, we had our passports because... We could have gotten to New York without them, but then we put them away for the trip and then got on a plane. I think it was maybe a train even, and that train was going to a different country and we had to have our passports and, you know, left them back at the hotel. And so I'm sure that checklist would have included, do you have your passport? So, so even, even when you think, you know what you're doing in the heat of the battle, it's easy to forget. It is. That's a good one. Okay. So a checklist save lives is number four. And then the final leadership lesson from the cockpit, include an alternate landing site in your flight plan. Have a backup plan, plan B. Yeah, I mean, and of course, intuitively, we all know that, right? In the cockpit, it's, who knows what could be happening, especially if you're flying over the water and something goes wrong. And there's this thing called a, a go, no-go point where, you know, beyond this point, you can't go back. And I think that has application to so many so many instances in business so we, we live in the world of helping our clients with technology strategy but when you're talking about like new systems or new ways of doing things new applications new business procedures like you make your best effort at getting to the destination you make your best effort at putting together a plan for how to get there but then you have to be able to come say you know what this is not working we have to go back to plan b we have to go back to a starting point because without that then you just obviously in a cockpit the impact could be fatal but even in business you tend to limp along not being able to go back if you haven't thought about that good plan b ahead of time yeah and don't you find even taking the time to strategize around plan b helps you accomplish plan a doesn't it just make you stronger all the way around no doubt no doubt that's a great point it's preparation because I think we're Very moving good. so fast and often just jump into things that just extra thought, that extra intentionality goes a long way for sure. Not to say that, that we did this with any kind of you know, forethought or expectation of what would happen in the last week, what happened with the bank collapse over the last yeah. several days. And I remember my CFO several years ago when we were putting together sort of our banking strategies, like, you know, I really think we need to have four or five banking solutions. We work with a number of banks so it allowed us to bank a few clients and that certainly helped build relationships. But just spreading our deposits and also our banking relationships around, who would have thought that, and now we are not, we were not part of that. We were not banking that, but who knew? And so, you know, really thinking through like what could go wrong, even though you never expect it to go wrong, you never expect something like that to fail, but thinking through what could go wrong and what do we do if? And um, so I certainly never would have thought that I would have put two and two together there and said, wow, it's a good thing, but you never know. Yeah, great initiative on his part. And also it just connects back to the first one because no doubt he was looking out at trends and scanning the environment to see what possibilities exist and what might we need to do differently as a result of that. Yeah, it really is interesting, the connection between all of these. Until we unpacked them and you talked through them in more detail, <laughs> I hadn't seen all of the connection points like I am right now, but there really is a synergy across all five. And I will say, and I'm sure you'll maybe share contact information after this, if somebody wants to get a copy, I have a couple extra copies of the book. So if someone emails me or they email you, we can certainly get copies of the book to them. But I think we probably did a pretty good job of summarizing them. Yeah, good. Well, how can our listeners connect with you? So our website is www.hartmanadvisors.com. My email is dhartman at hartmanadvisors.com. As we alluded to, I love this topic because it has so much application. We, we play a pretty critical role in providing independent, strategic technology and cyber advisory services to our clients, which, uh, like I said earlier, so much of what I learned even in the Navy and just outside of the aviation has really prepared me well for the company I lead 
today, which is really, you know, like I said, much more of an independent advisory. We don't sell technology or we don't profit from any certain system or software or hardware, which really allows us to step back for our clients and kind of have that bigger perspective for them, helping them achieve strategic goals in areas that quite frankly, most of our clients as business leaders really don't understand the world of technology and cyber. It's intimidating to them. And so having a trusted advisor like us that can help them reach their goals is, is important. We, we, we have a lot of fun. And navigate, navigate the changes and the challenges. IT and technical leadership never been more important, has it? I mean, just given how the world has changed over the last few years. Absolutely. And, you know, 10 years ago, I think when I would talk to CEOs and they talk about, you know, what are the most important elements of your business? Almost invariably, the answer was operations and finance. Yeah. I have to have strong operations and strong yeah. finance. And those two are still critically important to running a business. But today, invariably, when I talk to CEOs about the things that keep them up at night, the things that they worry about, the things that they know they have to be good at, invariably, it's people and technology. Operations and finance will always be critical. You always have to have those well-defined and, and humming. But more and more today, for a number of reasons, having a strong uh, people plan and taking care of engaging your people, and of course, having a strong technology plan. And those are two areas, I mean, you know, obviously you're in the world of, of people advisory, I'm in the world of technology advisory. Those tend to be two areas that most executives probably aren't as comfortable with. They're comfortable with their operations, they're comfortable with finance, maybe sales and marketing of what they do. People and technology tend to be sort of those big black boxes for a lot of executives. They're the big unknown. You know, I don't know what I don't know. It's something I know we've talked about. We both hear all the time from our executive clients. I equip emerging HR leaders because of my passion around what you just described. And since I started my career in the HR and talent space 20 plus years ago, you know, it's it's been about like building financial acumen within people leaders. And now I think it's let's build people leadership skills within finance leaders <laughs> and technology skills. And it's fun to see our two functions come together as well. I mean, the people function relies so heavily on technology, as do all parts of the business, which is why what you all are doing at Hartman's is so important as you're helping, helping to simplify that challenge for businesses. And we say all the time, we're not in the tech business, we're in the people business. I mean, so, you know, it's the technology, what we do is easy, uh, easier. It's how do your people leverage that technology, engage that technology, change, how open to change are they? How open to thinking outside of what they know to be true of a certain current state versus future state? So, and that's all people. That's not the system. So. And what a great team you have. I have loved getting to, to connect with and learn from your team members and such strong leaders they are as they're helping their clients navigate these challenges. I tell you, I thank you for saying that. And I've, certainly the same is true in reverse. I think we've really had some, some fun times beginning to figure out where those synergies are. But um, I took advice from, ironically, we're talking about CFO. I took advice from my first outsourced uh, CFO years ago who said, you'll never regret hiring great people. I took him up on that and I never regretted <laughs> that. I never looked back. But you know, we're about 100 strong now. And um, I, I always kid that of, of the 100 people, I'm probably the 90th smartest technology person <laughs> in our company. And that's okay with me. I mean, right. so, uh, As it so should be. I'm totally okay with As that. it should Maybe be. that's not quite true, but, uh, <laughs> but. Well, Dave, this is so good. Thank you for these timeless and universal leadership lessons. So helpful. I mean, it is interesting. I lead a leadership development business. You lead a technology focused business. And yet these leadership lessons, so important to both of us, you know, the the context of leadership changes, the content of leadership does not so much. It's the same things, right, that support success in one environment that will in another. So thank you for reminding us of those five. Constantly scanning your environment. You're only as good as your team. Trust your in instruments. Checklists save lives and having a backup plan. So good. No, it's been fun. And you're taking me back uh, on a journey from 20 some years ago. I may, I may go pull that flight suit out uh, <laughs> and that flight jacket out later on today, but it's been a fun conversation. Thank you, Andrea. Absolutely. Appreciate you, Dave. Thank you for joining us for this episode. 
please subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast to never miss a Being at Work story.